Imagine, my friends, if you will, that you were having a delicious dinner. The starter was the greatest thing you'd ever had in your life. The dessert made you want to do flips and run around and ring your mother and say, oh my gosh, this cheesecake I just have and changed my life. But like somewhere in the middle, someone just came onto your table, pulled their pants down and kind of crapped all over everything. Now that's being way too harsh because I did think WrestleMania Backlash was a terrific pay-per-view and kind of ties into this theme of WWE not having the best build but absolutely smashing it when it gets to a Sunday night. But there was just one match, one match which I will question until my dying day. However, we'll get there in one second because my name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling and ups and downs for, of course, WrestleMania Backlash where we're going to give the good bits an up and we're going to give the bad bits a down. Strap yourself in and let's go. Sheamus versus Ricochet was on the pre-show, and it was good. Up. Why we couldn't have built this up properly, I don't know. Although it did have some justification, because you can go, well, Simon and Sheamus doing an open challenge for the US title, so anybody could accept. And to be honest with you, if you had said to me, Simon, who do you want to accept? I would have said Ricochet. They kicked each other's ass too. I mean, they were laying in their shot so stiff. Until, unfortunately, Rick did walk into a bro kick. One, two, three. The Irishman is still your champion. The main thing I want to talk about, though, is that I think maybe this is going somewhere. Because afterwards, for some reason, Sheamus put back on his entrance attire. And I was like, who has ever done that in the history of wrestling? But then Ricochet beat him up and he stole Sheamus' hat and jacket. Now, you have never seen anybody so mad, especially because he could have just walked back through the curtain and gone on Amazon and bought some more. But yeah, if this does go somewhere, would I take Sheamus versus Ricochet round two later on on Raw? You're damn right I would. Just don't make it about fighting over clothes. But this did settle me into the show, which is the whole point. WrestleMania Backlash was then going properly, and our first match was for the Raw women's title as Charlotte Flair took on Rhea Ripley, who took on Oscar. And this was a good, good match. Up. Oscar was just awesome in the early going as she was flying around and reversing and transitioning into everything whereas Charlotte Flair being the bad guy was a lot more cautious and even got out of the ring at one point and Rhea Ripley was somewhere in the middle she was ready to be aggressive but she was also being smart one of the things I realized when I was watching this is that an absolute plus for Rhea Ripley is that she is the same height as Charlotte Flair Sometimes in the past, WWE has put Charlotte against Alexa Bliss and the height difference is crazy. But at one point during this match, they were going nose to nose and she really did look like the Queen's equal. They soon then went into a, well, why don't you hit me as hard as you can battle, which did end very badly for the champion because she was a dope here. Charlotte went, oh, it's your turn. And as soon as Rhea hit the ropes, Charlotte charged after her and smashed her right in the skull. Flair then went and did that crazy moonsault off the top rope to the outside where she essentially lands on her feet. And that is crazy athleticism. And then back in the ring, we were getting a double superplex from the top. We were getting a double natural selection. If you wouldn't like this, well, you're allowed not to like it. It's your life, but I thought it was fabo. As a lot of us had predicted though, Oscar had been snuck into this match just so she could eat the pin. So when she was fighting with Charlotte Flair on the apron, Charlotte gave her one to the face. She turned around, she got hit with the riptide and she got beaten for the Uno Dos Tres. And this was a little bit weird. So it was like, why didn't Charlotte break it up? But I don't really care. We then did have the most awkward moment ever because Rhea climbed up the ropes and celebrated with her championship as Charlotte just pointed at her. And I was like, what is it with pointing in WWE? If you had tuned in at this very moment, you would have gone, oh my gosh, Alexa Bliss has used her voodoo powers and she's turned Charlotte Flair into a statue. But I guess we will do this match down the line. As long as Rhea Ripley wins, I am okay with that. Bobby Lashley and MVP then arrived and I was like, what time do you call this, Bob and Umvup? You should have got here well earlier given you're in the WWE title match. And then John Morrison and The Miz were talking and Morrison was like, I'm going to go talk to the Lumberjacks and tell them to set a thirst trap for Damian Priest. Miz was like, I don't think you know what a thirst trap is. And I was like, no, he definitely does not. Because it was the Dirty Dogs versus the Mysterios. But as it turned out during the pre-show, Dolph Ziggler and Bobby Roode had attacked Dominic and they'd whooped his ass so bad, he wasn't even able to stand up. But because Rey Mysterio is a fighting dad, he was like, don't worry, sonny boy. I'll go out there and I'll win it by myself. And I was like, Rey, you are such a buffoon. But my word did I get behind him. Michael Cole then insulted us all by telling us that Ray's wife and daughter were watching on the Watch Long program. 
And I kind of put my hand up like, uh, excuse me, can you tell me why they vanished from my television? But I soon forgot about it, because this is what we had. It was essentially Rey Mysterio versus Raz, Rude and Ziggler. And because he is Rey Mysterio and he has all this experience and he has like the power of a warrior, at first, he was somehow winning. I mean, he went for a surprise roll up, which made all the sense in the world, given that's how Ray and Dominic had beaten Rude and Ziggles in singles competition over the last few weeks. And when Rude kicked out of that, Ray did that kind of sliding splash to the outside. I know I say this all the time, but I just can't understand it. He's almost 50 and he moves like he's seven. This carried on for a while too, before Dolphy Boy Blue and Robert were able to take advantage, because of course they had the numbers game. But even then, Ray found a way to fight back and he came this close before he got stuck in the tree of woe position and he injured his knee. And I was like, ah, oh, no. This was just an open wound for the champs though, who also then hit a double famouser. But at that point, from the back, all of a sudden, da 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 da, here came Dominic Mysterio. And even though he was limping and even though he was in pain, he didn't want to see his dad die. However, in the ring, Father Ray was like, son, I can't take you in because if I do, I'm sending you to your death. And I was like, there it is. It's an old fashioned but smart story. Somebody plug me in. Eventually, Ray had been whooped so much, Dominic was able to tag himself in. Damn it, he started running wild. But because he is quite inexperienced, he got murked by a spine buster. I was like, man, this is not going to end how I want to at all. Somehow, Dom was able to hit a super kick to tag his dad back in. And after his dad had taken care of business, he was then more than happy to tag his son back in. But at that point, I couldn't have given two hoots. And after he did that crazy sunset flip powerbomb thing into the barricade on Dolph Ziggler, Dominic Mysterio dove from the top rope like a swan. He hit the frog splash on to Robert Roode, and I was so excited about this, I counted along, and I went one, and I went two, and I went three. History had been made. The first ever father and son tag team champions. I'm not ashamed to admit, I cried. Not true, I didn't cry. Just thought it was really well done. I mean, all of this was just so satisfying, and Kayla Braxton interviewed them afterwards. They were like, oh, we did it, I can't believe we did it. And I'm kind of worried that we get to SmackDown and we do a rematch and they just lose it again. But do not do that and let them hold it for months and months. I mean, now we have Rey Mysterio and the baby champ. And I'm all good with that. Up. And now we're going to talk about what I hinted at during the intro. Because we then learned that in tonight's The Miz versus Damian Priest Lumberjack match, the Lumberjacks were going to be... Zombies. Because John Morrison went to talk to said Lumberjacks and when he opened the door in a dark smoky room, there was dozens of the undead. And as you can imagine, John Morrison turned to the camera and he was like, what the flub is going on? Now we really should have seen this coming, given that the pay-per-view was sponsored by Army of the Dead, the brand new movie with Batista that's all about zombies. And I just hope that WWE got a big fat marketing check for this, because it just stood out like a sore thumb. And look, again, I get it, marketing, it's important. You've got to increase that bottom line. But I just have so many questions. Where did these zombies come from? Are zombies now canon in the WWE universe? And am I meant to think these are real zombies or was it just people pretending to be zombies? I didn't get any answers. This all tied into some comedy as well where John Morris was like, Miz, Miz, a bunch of zombies are coming. And Miz was like, ha ha ha, there's no zombies. But obviously in around about a few seconds, he was gonna find out that there was most definitely zombies. In between all that too, we saw crazy Jay Uso bump into mad Jimmy Uso in Roman Reigns locker room where Jay was basically being like, would you stop disrespecting our tribal chief? And Jimmy was like, I'll do whatever I want, because as my t-shirt says, I'm nobody's bitch. Jimmy was also insinuating that his brother should look around at Roman Reigns' locker room, because isn't it nicer than everybody else's? Which is when the head of the table did arrive, and Jimmy very sarcastically was like, well, I hope you win later, champ. I don't think he meant it. All of this, though, did lead us into the zombie lumberjack match. And it's been a few hours since I watched all this and I'm still processing it in my brain. But honestly, I am so confused. Because we do have a few issues here. I mean, one, for like the 19th time, Damian Priest in what should have been a big match kind of became background fodder. So when he had his big match at WrestleMania, the focus was on Bad Bunny. Throughout this feud with John Morris and The Miz, the focus has been on John Morris and The Miz as they surprise roll up each other. And now here... It was about zombies. And look, I don't mind anybody having some fun. I saw some people on social media that they were laughing about this and I mentioned it to my girlfriend. She went, oh, that sounds really entertaining, even though she doesn't understand wrestling at all. And you should be allowed to do whatever the hell you want to do. With that said, this was really bad down. I mean, Miz and Morrison tried to run away in the early going, but a spooky zombie monster stopped them. 
And once again, I was like, well, why isn't the spooky zombie monster trying to eat their brains? Because that's what zombies do. And it kind of almost meant the entirety of this was the Miz being like, oh no, they're zombies, to the point he forgot about Damien Priest. But then about five minutes into it, both the Miz and Damien Priest were fighting off zombies. And I think my brain, ironically, kind of fell out of my head through my ear and just splattered on the floor. Morrison decided to start kicking some of them in the head and diving on them at one point, because yeah, in the movies, that's always worked. But when he was stood on the barricade, two zombies came from nowhere and they grabbed him down into the depths. So unless he comes back on Raw as a zombie, I don't know how WWE is going to explain this. Because again, if they're not zombies, what do they do? Just kiss him? Just rub his face? And if that is the case, why didn't he just push them off and come back into the match? Then all of a sudden, back in the squared circle, Damien Priest hit the hit the lights to get the one, two, three. And if you thought we were done there, we weren't, because then the zombies jumped into the ring, and we were supposed to think they too were eating at Miz's face. So we have to ask another question, or presume that tomorrow night or later on Raw, the Miz is going to be a zombie. And seriously, these two better turn up tonight, all dead and shit. Otherwise, what was the point? I know I said that a few times, but I need somebody to tell me what the point was. And the other thing is, I was well up for seeing Dave Bautista's new film, because I think he's quite good, and I like the zombie horror things. But now I'm like, man, maybe I shouldn't watch it, because I don't ever want to be supporting actions like this. So yes, this was truly, truly baffling, but I want to make it very clear. If it put a smile on your face, all the power to you, that's how it should be. I just don't need zombies in my wrestling. The Usos were then just having such a bad evening too, because they bumped into each other again. And Jay Uso was like, man, you don't understand. You need to come listen to Roman Reigns. And Jimmy was all like, man, you're just a lackey. These two are either going to get back together or the family is going to be broken up forever. And I can't handle that. It's happened too much. We were then back on track after this because it was Bianca Belair defending her SmackDown title against Bailey. Just decent stuff. Up. They got some serious time as well, so they were able to tell a proper story, which at first was Bianca is a much better wrestler than Bailey, which pissed Bailey off. So she rolled to the outside, like, man, whatever happened to me, I was doing real well. Now I can't even take over Bianca Belair. She did have something in her back pocket, though, which was, of course, aha, I can cheat, which is what she did do when she grabbed Bianca Belair's earring again and pulled her down to the mat. And then she was on top. And obviously, Bianca Belair, you need to stop wearing these earrings. They have now become a clear target. Eventually, they went to the outside where Bailey used the steel steps, which was not a disqualification. But again, we had zombies on this show, so I'm not going to worry about stuff like that. Before she just started going, <laughs> laughing in Bianca's face. That was a really bad move. That was like breathing new life into Bianca Belair. Like all the momentum came out of Bailey's mouth and went into hers. And that's the most disgusting thing I've ever said. Because she got nailed by a spine buster, which led Bailey to try to do a dive to the outside, which she absolutely missed. And as I said on Wednesday, we have to retire this move now because Darby Allen has owned it. Although somebody later on, and not somebody you're expecting, may also be in the running for that conversation. But we'll talk about it in a bit. Bailey was then cheating, trying to use the ropes off a pin because she's just a massive asshole. And when she went from the rose plant, from nowhere, Bianca Belair hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. However, she also took her hair and wrapped it around Bailey's legs. And all of that together was enough to score the pinfall and retain her title. And yes, this was another example of WWE doing this finish too much, but at least it had a little bit of a twist. Although short in execution, it was a little bit wonky. And I also think it's kind of strange where your dominant champion wins with a surprise roll up. But hey, if I'm going to get mad about that, I may as well get mad about WWE overall. It also probably keeps the door open to continue on this feud. And I'm certainly not done with it. So give it a couple of thumbs. And it's yet more thumbs for what followed because it was Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre versus Braun Strowman for the WWE title. And what a hoss fight this was. You should actually go out of your way to see it up. Because the idea here was that all three guys were going to try and kill each other and they would do it around the Thunderdome. Although Braun Strowman especially clearly wanted to murder someone. Because not only, yes, going back to what I said earlier, did he do a dive off the apron where he almost landed on his neck? But later on, Drew McIntyre gave him a Mishinoku driver. And I don't think I'm over it. Also, Bobby Lashley gave Braun this terrific slam. 
these three guys absolutely killed it. Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley were even teaming up in the early going because they are fighting a monster among men. And they gave him a stalling suplex, which is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my life. And yes, that's an exaggeration. But then it all broke down, so we did the whole, hey, don't you steal my pin spot. And soon Bob and Drew were punching each other in the skull. Braun was then smashing Bobby Lashley with the steel stairs as Drew McIntyre Claymore kicked Strowman over the barricade. And that spot always works. When our WWE champion and Drew walked up the entranceway and McIntyre grabbed him and threw him into the entrance LED boards. And because WWE has terrible wiring, there was a big explosion and Bobby Lashley just vanished at this point. So I was like, oh, I was actually right. He must be dead. We weren't done at all though, because then Braun Strowman was doing a running senton in the ring on Drew McIntyre. I was like, what program am I watching? And he got so mad, probably because no one played his train sound effects this evening. He then picked up the Scottish boy and he power bombed him into the announce table. I mean, this really was entertaining from start to finish and they worked each one of their segments so well. It's like Bobby was here, then he was gone and Drew McIntyre was here and Braun Strowman, he was gone. And even though the finish once more was exactly what we predicted, who cares when you watch a rom-com and they get together, you don't go, well, that's absolute crap. It's why you tuned in and it was the same with this. Because McIntyre eventually fought back to his feet and he hit Braun Strowman with the Claymore. But then Bob was back from the dead. He threw McIntyre out the ring. He then hit Braun Strowman with a spear. That was it. It was done. He's still your WWE champion. And of course, at the next pay-per-view, we can then do Drew versus Bobby. We all saw it coming. This was really fun, though. It was just chaos from the second it started. And I actually think overall it helped Braun Strowman, even though he did lose. Because for the first time in ages, he has actually looked like a monster among men or man. As it turns out as well, we have shifted around the pay-per-view calendar because it's going to be hell in a cell come June. We probably did this so that we can do Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre in that damn structure. And when we are done there, we just got to leave it and go in a brand new direction. This all did mean that our proper main event was Roman Reigns versus Cesaro for the Universal title. And this was so smart on behalf of WWE because it was the last match. So if you really wanted to believe they were doing that because Cesaro was going to be crowned, you could. <laughs> But it didn't happen, but my word, what an up. Beforehand too, Roman was talking to Jay in the back and said, look, don't come down to ringside this evening. And Jay, that crazy tamale, then insinuated, but what if you lose? And you should have seen Reigns' face. He then compared him to Jimmy. So I'm starting to see the cracks. With that story out of the way for the evening though, it meant we could focus on the wrestling and what a good technical wrestling match this was. Of course, Cesaro was the better of the two when it came for, well, can you get me or can I get you? So Roman rolled out of the ring because he was super mad, but then he powered up because he is the head of the table and he started to punch him in the head too. That wasn't working massively well, so Reigns decided to target Cesaro's arm and that's when our brand new tail came into focus. I mean, he was taking it and slamming into the ring post. He was slamming into the announce table. Essentially, if he could take this limb and try to rip it from Cesaro's body, that's what he was gonna try and do. Every time Cesaro tried to fight back too, Roman would cut him off. But when he went for the Superman punch and missed, Cesaro was able to apply the sharpshooter, but unfortunately Reigns got to the ropes. But at this stage, it was becoming clear, oh no, the Swiss Superman can't do any of his offense because his arm is started to go all ganky. Cesaro then went nuts and did his corkscrew over the top rope onto Roman Reigns. And then he was moving so fast. I was like, who does he think he is? The flipping flash. And when he had Roman ready to hit the neutralizer again, of course he couldn't do it because he was essentially like this. I really, really think he needed some help. The same thing happened when he went for an uppercut and Roman Reigns in a panic then tried to choke him out. But Cesaro got out of that and tried another submission to which Roman Reigns power bombed his way out of it. And that got such a close near two. I was like, that is it, man. I'm into this. This was a terrific put together match. Sadly, it did leave the Swiss man in a position where he could go back into the choke. And while he tried to get out of it, he couldn't because again, he didn't have one arm. And eventually he did pass out because that's how the human body works. And the referee had no choice but to say, I'm sorry, says, you're out of here. And Roman Reigns is still your champion. And I was overjoyed here too because there was absolutely no shenanigans. And I know some people wanted it to protect Cesaro, but let's move away from that, especially because all the shenanigans were saved for after the match. Because Jey Uso was out here almost instantly, like the manipulated maniac that he is. And after Roman Reigns had whispered something to him, Jay obviously started to beat down Cesaro. From nowhere though, Seth Rollins' music hit and he was wearing some kind of suit that looked like a felt tip pen had thrown up over him. 
And he had this stare down with Roman Reigns, which is always going to be good based on their history. And just as you thought, oh my gosh, maybe he's going to attack Roman. Of course, he went after Cesaro. He really hates him. He busted that arm up too good and proper before laying him out with a curb stomp. And I am massively intrigued to see what we're going to do here. Because deep down in my tum-tum, I think the SummerSlam match is going to be Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins. But if you do do that, who's going to be the good guy and who's going to be the bad guy? And does Seth Rollins win? Also, how does Cesaro fit into the middle? All of that has me very intrigued and it gets a damn round of applause. So this was an absolute terrific pay-per-view that made my Monday morning very pleasurable. Apart from the point where a bunch of zombies walked out and they just went zombies. But look, I can just take that memory and throw it over there. It didn't take away from anything else. And overall, is getting it up. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about WrestleMania, Backlash, but mainly zombies. I know how the internet works. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. We got a website, whatculture.com, where you can get ready for tonight's Raw. Come say hello on social media. And also, as you are here on YouTube, click a video around my head and watch another one. Who knows what you're going to get. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. And if you would like to tune in tomorrow to watch those ups and downs for Raw, please do. I look forward to seeing your face.